Hello and welcome to my channel. Bonjour et bienvenue sur ma chaîne. My name is Muriel and today, as I said in my previous video, I will be doing a review of the entire Earth Sea Cycle. Now, I reread the Earth Sea series this year because, well, for one thing, I had new Ursula K. Le Guin material to go through, and you know, I thought, why not reread some of her classic works? I'm going to go through each book cover, you know, the main storyline, introduce the characters. I'll talk about the characters more in depth afterwards, but so I'm going to go through each book and obviously present the world. The world of Earth Sea is basically an archipelago of islands, hence Earth and Sea. There's no major continent, it's just sort of islands. There are two main, let's say, races of peoples, phenotypes of peoples. The more numerous one are the Archipelagans, or Hardic people. They are the ones who have wizards among them, and they have brown, dark brown, reddish brown skin, dark hair, dark eyes. And then you have people from the Kargat lands, the Kargish people, and they are pale skinned, with lighter coloured hair, blonde, light brown, and blue grey eyes. They're currently living under a god emperor, if you will, and the Archipelagans, at a point in their history, they had a king and they were unified, but now it's mostly each island basically governs itself. There can be lords or merchant lords. The villages are also basically self-governed. I mean, there are elements of feudalism, but it's not classically feudal either. And of course, you know, this is classic fantasy, so no advanced technology. It's uh, basically basically medieval to renaissance era type of technology, but they do have wizards. Which brings us to this. A Wizard of Earthsea introduces us to one of the main characters of the series, Paul Sparrowhawk, though his true name is Ged. I will here introduce the concept of true names, very, very important in this series. There is in Earthsea commonly spoken languages, you have Hardic, you have Kargish, and then you have the true language, the original language, which is, well, more or less, the language of creation and the language in which magic is performed, the one wizards use and the ones dragons speak. And so everything in the universe has a true name. The name is supposed to be the essence of a thing or an individual. So each individual human, each individual dragon as well, has a true name which is supposed to encapsulate their essence. There's a lot of power in true names and it is given to you at puberty, at a naming ceremony. So you have a use name, which everyone refers to you by, and then you have a true name. So Sparrowhawk's true name is Ged, and Sparrowhawk is a young boy from the island of Gaunt, and our young Sparrowhawk has the gift of magic, and this potential is recognised by another village wizard who gives him his true name and says, well, my lad, you need to foster this gift. And so he is sent off to the OG Hogwarts, which is the school of wizardry on the island of Roke. Unfortunately, our young wizard isn't exactly the most humble of youth. He's quite ambitious and arrogant, doesn't really take criticism that well or taunts and challenges from other students, most notably a student named Jasper, who dares him to prove that he belongs among the other students. And so one day they go onto a very almost sacred place on Roke Island called Roke Knoll and he tries a summoning spell and brings into the world a shadow from the in-between places of the universe. Something very old that just does not belong in Earthsea. Ged is attacked by the shadow and then spends some time recovering and this really impacts his behaviour, his personality even. He loses all confidence in himself. He is truly humbled by his encounter with the shadow. Nonetheless, he continues his training, completes it, and then becomes a wandering wizard. So he goes on various journeys, but he comes to realise that he's going to have to face this shadow he has released into the world, confront it and perhaps even integrate it in a way. So this is a really classic fantasy story in a way. It's the hero's quest, pure and simple, the hero's journey of going out into the world, discovering who you are, confronting your demons, and well, becoming a full person afterwards. On to the tombs of Archwan. This is quite a different story actually. First of all, the point of view character changes. Now it becomes a female character called Tanar, or throughout most of the book she is known as Arha. She is from the Kargad 
Netherlands. And when she was a very young child, about five years old, she was taken from her home to become the priestess of the old powers at the tombs of Archon. It's a, it's a religious shrine because in the belief system of the Kargish, she is the reincarnation of the previous priestess. So she is raised by fellow priestesses to become this vessel of the old powers. Now, the old powers aren't a concept unique to the Kargish. They're actually supposed to be present throughout all of Earthsea. The thing is, the Archipelagans, and more specifically the wizards, believe that the old powers are at best very dangerous, at worst basically evil, dirty, not to be messed with, and conveniently enough those old powers are linked to female magic. I didn't go into details and I will elaborate upon this further, obviously, but the people who practice magic in Earthsea are majoritarily men. Women can be witches, they cannot be mages or wizards, because women are inferior, their type of magic is dangerous, dirty, wrong, linked to these old powers of the earth. It's quite a, not violently misogynistic society, but it is quite a sexist society, and, and with regards to the most incredible source of power, magic, there's definitely a, an unjust hierarchy going on there. But in any case, in the Kargad lands, they have a very different belief system, they don't have magic, there the old powers are still worshipped, and the apex of this worship is at the tombs of Archon, Tanar slash Arha. Arha is basically the name she's being given because her name is eaten, her individuality is symbolically ritually eaten by the old ones because her life is supposed to be wholly devoted to their worship. So Arha spends her youth learning how to conduct rituals and her life is also spent a lot in the dark because part of her worship duties is going down into a maze underground where light is not permitted. But then, guess what? <laughs> Ged makes an appearance in this novel as well. He's made prisoner by Arha down in the labyrinths, but they end up striking a relationship. Not a romantic relationship, actually, which is something I really appreciated. Something more subtle. This is gonna sound weird, but more human, like a more genuine human connection than just, you know, the generic, oh, they met and they fell in love. And Arha is given back her name by Ged. She becomes once again Tanar, and she is, in a way, reborn. And this causes her to question everything she thought she knew and she thought she believed about her life and, you know, her religious duty. And to make a long story short, well, they leave the tombs of Archwan. So this was a very psychological tale. I mean, most of the book is Tanar being confronted with no one else but herself down in the dark, and I, I really enjoyed this one. Then on to the father's shore. A few years have passed, and Ged, Sparrowhawk, is once again at the forefront of the story. Though the narrator is not Ged, it's a new character called Aaron. His true name is Lebanon with a young prince from the Isle of Enlad, and something very wrong is going on in Earthsea. Magic and all the things to do with making, shaping, arts, crafts, even good relationships between people, all of that goodness is leaching out from the world. Aaron is sent to Roke as an envoy to ask, you know, what the hell's going on? We've been receiving these stories from traders and voyagers that the these things are happening, and so he and Sparrowhawk go on a quest to the westernmost island of the archipelago, the farthest shore, to go to the borders between life and death, because they think there's something wrong with the equilibrium between life and death. And Aaron is... <laughs> literally the prince that was promised. He is the king to be to reunite all the islands of Earthsea, and it's it's a classic story of the coming of the promised king, basically. Also a hero's quest, but with that added specifier, and a story, of course, about the balance between life and death. And you go into the land of the dead, for the first time as well. The Archipelagans actually know what happens to them when they die. They're gonna go into a kind of purgatory, a dry land, where you're just a shade. You don't care about any of the other souls you might have shared life and love with. You're just there. There are no other essences or spirits of living creatures, and no birds, no plants, no dragons, and no carcass. So yeah, basically classic hero's journey and coming of the promised king foretold 
Bill Bight prophecy to Hanu. Now, what's interesting about this is this was written 18 years, well, no, maybe not written, but published 18 years after the Father's Shaw. The Father's Shaw was supposed to be the conclusion to an original trilogy, but no, out came this. Now, Tahanu follows immediately after the Father's Shaw. We are back with Tanar, and we learn that once Tanar settled down in Gaunt, she got married, she had children, and now she's a middle-aged woman, and she's widowed, her husband has died. Her children have moved out from her household, they're grown, and she, she, she doesn't really know what her place in the world is anymore. And then a messenger from her village comes to her and says, we found this little girl, she's been horrifically burned, she's at the doors of death basically, but she survives, and they learn that she was in all probability sexually abused by her family, and Tanar decides to take care of this little girl. She names her Feru, and Feru understandably doesn't talk much, she's very reserved, she's very shy, and then Ged arrives on Gaunt, on Dragonback in style, directly from his journey into the land of dead with Aaron slash Lebanon from the Father's Shore. And well, Ged is no longer a wizard. He had to repair a breach in the universe to fix the balance between life and death, and all of his power went into that, basically. Ged is profoundly scarred by his loss of power. Being a wizard was the entirety of his identity, and he's well into middle age by this point, and he has to find out who he is without all the trappings of power and magic. And Tanar wants to take care of him or reach out to him because they had this very profound, genuine connection back when they met in the tombs of Artuan. And then also a quite convincing and beautiful relationship develops between them. Feru is in the middle of this, this little girl. And now, not only is she horribly disfigured, obviously, but there's a secondary character called Moss. And she's a witch. She's a village witch. And you get to finally learn a bit more about women's position in society and women's magic more importantly. Witches. Their power, their experience. And Moss can say that Feru, there's something a bit different about her. She has power, she tells Tanar. It's quite a slow-paced story. It's very, I want to call it domestic fantasy. It's all on the island of Gaunt. It's all about this little extended reconstructed family and household. I love this so much. I probably enjoyed it a lot more than the first time I read it, and I'm not really that used to domestic fantasy, but I really, really love this. If you're wondering what Tahanu is, well, Tahanu is Theru's real name, and as to her real identity, you know what? You can find out for yourselves. <laughs> But moving on. Now, I said Tahanu came out 18 years after the Father's Shore. 10 years after Tahanu came out Tales from Earthsea and the last book in the Earthsea cycle, The Other Wind. This is actually a collection of short stories, and you might be asking, well, why is it in a specific chronological order within the series then? Well, one of the short stories in this actually bridges the end of Tahanu and The Other Wind. So you have five short stories in this. They all span a few hundred years of Earthsea history. So you have stories that take place way before A Wizard of Earthsea. You have The Finder, which is about the founding of the wizarding school on Roke. And it shows you that women actually had a very important role in that process. It was a really, really good story. It's one of the longest short stories. That and Dragonfly are the longest in this collection. Dragonfly being the one that bridges Tahanu and the other wind. You also have the story Dark Rose and Diamond, which is basically about love and magic. Then you have the Bones of the Earth, a story about Ged's original mentor, the wizard who gave him his name, and his own mentor. Ged's mentor's name is Ojayan, and he is known on Gaunt for having stopped an earthquake. But the fact of the matter is, he didn't do it alone. And the other short story is on the High Marsh. It's about a wizard who has forgotten a part of himself. But this allows him to reconnect to being a good person, really, and who finds himself in a pretty isolated village. And Ged comes to, I guess, complete his atonement, you could say that. And finally, we have the other wind. The other wind picks up ten-ish years after the end of Tahanu. The breach that Ged and Aaron slash Lebanon fixed 
in the land of the dead. Well, it appears they didn't really fix it because things are going awry again. The dead are hounding the dreams, or I guess you should call them nightmares, of a village sorcerer called Alder. He's a mender. His purpose in life is to fix things, fix broken objects, and the love of his life, who became his wife, was a witch. But his wife died. And out of the blue, he dreams one night that he is going down to the wall that separates life and death. And he goes up to that wall, not really realizing that he's actually astral projecting, and his wife is there. And weirdly enough, she recognizes him and calls out to him and says, you need to help us. We want to truly die. We don't want to live in this state of limbo, of, of living death. We want to be free to truly die and move on. And so Alder seeks out the wizards on Roke Island and they tell him, well, according to us, you should probably go to Gaunt, where Ged is, since he was Archmage, or he technically still is symbolically. So that's what he does. And Ged ships him off to the island of Havnor, which is the central island Island, where the official capital of Ursi is, where King Lebanon holds court. With King Lebanon are Tanar and Tehanu, who are there to advise him regarding, first of all, a possible Kargish archipelagan alliance through marriage, and another problem, the dragons are back. By that I mean they're coming towards the human islands and basically laying waste to villages, and they don't actually want to purposefully kill people, they just want to destroy what humans have made. So Lebanon is dealing with all kinds of crap and then Alder comes along and starts talking about this shit that's happening with the dead and so yeah you have all these characters regrouping and then they go to Roke and well gonna try and deal with this situation and of course trying to figure out why this is happening now. So now I'll touch upon uh, the character development a bit. Ged has a very I think interesting character development. We literally see him throughout all the major stages Ages of his life. We first meet him when he's a very young boy and we leave him when he's, well, an old man. As a young boy, as I mentioned, he was pretty arrogant, full of ambition, but you know, then he gets to the wizarding school on Roke Island and gets smacked down a bit by releasing that shadow and then has to learn to face his demons. He becomes Archmage, and you can see he's gained a lot of maturity, a lot of stability. When he meets Tanar, there is a lot of genuine empathy and kindness and, and true shining humanity in him. The power is still the main core of his identity, but then in the Father's Shore, he spends all of that power to mend the breach between the world of the living and the world of the dead, and that core of his identity comes crashing down. And and he's already, like I said, by the time we get to Tahanu, he's what, in his 40s, his 50s? And he has to build himself anew and also foster a rekindled relationship with Tanar, and that was really beautiful to read about. And quite satisfyingly, he does end up finding a measure of peace with his uh, newfound stature. Then you have, I think, my favorite character, Tanar. Her character arc is also quite transformative and intense. She starts out her life again taken from her home as a very little girl to become this priestess of the old powers. And she's very plucky as a young girl, I find. she does, She's full of a hunger to, to be in control of her life. She wants independence, she wants to be respected, and she latches onto that bit of power that is given her. And then she has to let that go, ultimately, and that's very hard. Then she goes to the archipelago, back with Ged. She gets married and she has children and she lives out out her young adult years as a housewife. But then her husband dies, and then she adopts Feru, then Tahanu. And it's a bit like Ged, basically as well, I'm here about 40 years old, what do I do now as a woman in Archipelagan society? And her friendship with a local village witch called Moss is very important to her growing understanding of the real power women can have. And then there's this beautiful blossoming relationship with Ged, very frustrating at times because he's recovering from his own psychological wounds. So there's this interplay between them, both trying to reconstruct themselves as individual human beings in the later stages of their life. There's also her concern for her adopted daughter, and she displays just a lot of wisdom and just genuine deeply felt emotions. I loved reading the story from her point of view. 
Then you have Aaron slash Lebanon, the prince that was promised, who becomes king of all Earthsea. He was a nice character. Maybe, though, little critique, a bit too nice, a bit too flawless. He's a youth who was raised as a prince from a noble family, so raised with an awareness of duty, of the importance of responsibility, a willingness to do good, to be of service to others. But what's interesting is as he becomes king, the burdens of rule start to really weigh on his shoulders. And he gets very frustrated because he also will probably have to marry someone he doesn't really want to. I like to see those little cracks in his flawlessness that just show he is, he's human. And then you have probably the most mysterious character, Feru slash Tahanu. In the book Tahanu, she doesn't speak a lot. I mean, she's a little girl, deeply, deeply traumatized and scarred, both physically and mentally. But slowly you do see her making progress and opening up well, to Tana, obviously, her adoptive mother. But then slowly others. And then she grows into a young woman who fundamentally is still very shy, very very reserved, but there's a deep well of wisdom inside it, which ultimately has to do with the nature of her being, and finally does find release and ultimate freedom by rejoining her original people. It's it's hard to, to identify with her because she's such a different type of character, but I, I really liked her. She was interesting. I mean, there is a fierceness to her. She's fragile, but at the same time there's this strength and resistance, which is quite inspiring. I'll mention something about the way the Earth the sea cycle is written. This might sound weird, but when I read it, I was reminded of the Lord of the Rings for some reason. The way the Lord of the Rings was written, there's something, and I think that was the point to write it that way, there's something very mythical about the way the Lord of the Rings is written, which is something I didn't dislike, but kind of held me off the story. And I kind of had that feeling here. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but whereas her style really draws me in with her science fiction writing, here there was almost something too distant about the story. And yet I felt I was in it because she writes very well, that's not the problem. But So there was a bit of a I don't know, like a membrane between me and, and, and the universe of Earthsea. It's fairly simple world building though. I mean, it's, it's not the most complex I've ever seen. The world building there is though is largely coherent, consistent. And since the tone of the story is pretty legendary, like it's hard to explain, I guess it doesn't matter too much if there aren't more details. I think one of the major themes is what does it mean to uphold balance in the world, in the way humans interact with the world, with each other. There's a right place for everything and if you mess with the order of the universe, bad things are going to happen and you will pay a price, inevitably. Another major theme is power. Power is extremely central to the stories of Earthsea. What does it mean to have power? Power can potentially be used for good, but you need a lot of guardrails in place. You need maturity, knowledge, wisdom. Those things can easily be either absent or corrupted even. What is women's power? What is men's power? Is there a difference between the two? Should we seek power at all? In the end, you can see that the main characters relinquish power or it gets stripped away from them. And aren't they somehow better off without it? I mean, that's kind of the question that is posed. Is power necessary to attain freedom or peace? or happiness. Life changes, that's also very important because, I mean, two of the most important characters, Ged and Tanar, well, you kind of see them throughout their lives, when they're very, very young and when they're, well, old. It's about growth, about accepting the fact that life is nothing but change. Life entails change, decay, and death. Again, going back to the notion of equilibrium, you cannot have life without death, and you shouldn't try to hang on to life at all costs. That's very dangerous. And there's also love, quite simply. But not, like I said, a fixation on romantic love. There is the love between Ged and Tanar, but it's not infatuated love. I wouldn't even say they're in love with each other. They love each other. And there's the love of the student for the mentor, the love of a parent for their child, and the love of friends and brothers in spirit, or sisters in spirit. The strength of love, and even the suggestion that love is the only true form of immortality there is. I'll let that sink in.
The Earth Sea Cycle is is it's not my favorite thing by Le Guin. Honestly, after rereading it, it's not my favorite of her works. But it's a classic of fantasy literature for a reason. It's a very special series, I think. It's very thoughtful and unlike a lot of classic heroic or epic fantasy, there is no greater overarching conflict between good and evil. There isn't a main big bad antagonist. A lot of it is very very psychological and internal. Tahani was very domestic, like I said. Also a lot darker than the three preceding books, I should add. And this leads me to, unfortunately, a bittersweet ending note. I didn't really like The Other Wind. If I had to rank the books in order of how much I enjoy them, Tahanu would definitely come out on top, closely followed by The Tombs of Atuan on, I would say, more or less equal footing with The Wizard of Earthsea. Then would come Tales from Earthsea, I think I would put it in third place. Then The Father's Jewel. And then in the last place, The Other Wind, the conclusion to the series. And you know, when I finished this, I thought to myself, maybe she should have just left it up to Hanu in a way. Because unfortunately, there were a lot of contradictions presented, as far as I'm concerned, by the last book. I was left with a lot of questions, and not in the good way of, oh, an open ending left to your imagination, building upon what you previously read. This introduced information that I felt was dissonant with regards to the rest of the series and that really really annoyed me especially with regards to the dragons and the humans and this land of the dead I mentioned so that's really disappointing it's still a series worth reading by all means it is a classic of fantasy fiction though ultimately yes I guess I prefer Le Guin's science fiction rather than her fantasy fiction onto the quotes now to change this rock into a jewel, you must change its true name. And to do that, my son, even to so small a scrap of the world, is to change the world. Get saw something akin to his own power, something that went as deep as wizardry. From that time forth, he believed that the wise man is one who never sets himself apart from other living things, whether they have speech or not. It is very hard for evil to take hold of the unconsenting soul. It is no secret. All power is one in source and end, I think. Years and distances, stars and candles, water and wind and wizardry, the craft in man's hand and the wisdom in a tree's root, they all arise together. What she had begun to learn was the weight of liberty. Freedom is a heavy load, a great and strange burden for the spirit to undertake. It is not easy. It is not a gift given, but a choice made, and the choice may be a hard one. And though I came to forget or regret all I have ever done, yet would I remember that once I saw the dragons aloft on the winded sunset above the western isles, and I would be content. We must learn to keep the balance. Having intelligence, we must not act in ignorance. Having choice, we must not act without responsibility. I go back into the dark, before the moon I was. No one knows, no one knows, no one can say what I am, what a woman is, a woman of power, a woman's power, deeper than the roots of trees, deeper than the roots of islands, older than the making, older than the moon. She said, why are men afraid of women? If your strength is only the other's weakness, you live in fear, Ged said. There's no less or greater in an absolute thing. All or nothing at all, the true lover says, and that's the truth of it. What do we know of eternity but the glimpse we get of it when we enter in that bond? We must choose and choose again. The animals need only be and do. We're yoked and they're free. So to be with an animal is to know a little freedom. And that concludes my review of the Earthsea Cycle. If you're into fantasy, I think this is definitely one of the must-reads on the list of classics in the genre. And if you have read it, well, please tell me what you thought. Next time I will be back with a shorter video, but in the meantime, I hope you all have a lovely day or evening. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.